several people said they wanted to join but had conflicts this evening. So um, they're going to be viewing this, uh, the, the recording. But thanks everybody for coming tonight um, to learn about the Young Voter Engagement Project. Um, we're looking for volunteers for this project. It is part of the American University Law School's Marshall Brennan Project. Um, and the um, part of this partnership is the um, American University Washington School of Law um, have a Marshall Brennan Teaching Fellow Project. And the teaching fellows are law students and they teach constitutional law and civics in classrooms in five DC schools. Um, those are Ballou, Dunbar, Capital City Charter, Jackson Reed, and School Without Walls. Um, for the past, oh, I don't know how many years, not that many, um, the DC League of Women Voters has been invited by AU to visit the classrooms to register and engage and mobilize the students um, on issues that concern them, um, like statehood. Um, and I will say that um, the, the students in these high school classrooms are referred to by their teaching fellows as scholars. Um, the students in these classes are, um, these are elective courses. Students are there because they, they want to be. Um, and they're treated, um, you know, they're, they're treated um, as scholars. Our goal is to complete visits to the five schools before October the 13th. Uh, October the 15th is the deadline for the DC Board of Elections to receive either online or paper voter registration applications. After October 15th, people can still do, do same day registration um, in early voting or on election day, but we would really like um, to get these young people registered um, by um, October 15th. So um, that is our plan. Uh, we're going to organize teams of two people to make presentations at each school. One of these uh, team members would be a league member who's experienced with uh, voting procedures in DC. And the second team member would be um, a younger person who could engage scholars on statehood and other issues of interest uh, to the young people. Our, our goal is to motiv motivate and energize these young people in our democracy. We're going to provide a slide deck and a script to use in the presentation. Um, and we're going to show you that this evening. Uh, a special feature of the presentation is going to be a special two and a half minute animation that was professionally produced for us and that focuses specifically on young voters. Deborah Hanlon, who's in the meeting tonight, and I went to the fellow seminar last week um, on the AU Law Campus. We met the fellows, we talked about our plans for presentations, and we got feedback from the fellows on their class schedules and their scholars. The fellows shared that DC statehood is of great interest to their scholars. And I'm gonna turn it over to Deborah, who is going to describe the teaching fellows, their classrooms and their scholars and what their availability is for our presentations. Thank you, Barbara. Um, yes, I'll be very quick. Um, I will describe each of the five schools and the teaching fellows and their suggestions for preferred dates for us to go in. So they have actually given us some dates. So if you're available and interested, you could choose. Um, Deborah, excuse me. Um, Jess, could you please uh, screen share that document if you've got it? I think that was NASDAR has it, NASDAR can Yeah, I'll, I'll pull it up, no problem. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. One second. Okay. 
Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so the first school on this list, it's a little table that describes um, the class. And then it also gives us the lead fellow. I think there's two or three fellows that are teaching, but the fellow, the name here is actually the lead person and there's their uh, contact information. So the first school is Jackson Reed. And Jackson Reed, they said it, there are about 24 sophomores and junior high school students. And they're very smart and engaged, but only about half of them are really knowledgeable about current civics. And they said the some of the topics that they're really interested in, of course, are statehood and any other issue that's specific to the DC ballot. And just even some of the basics about voting. So that, that should be uh, fairly straightforward at Jackson. Um, another school is the Capital City Charter School. Oh, before we leave Jackson Reed, um, Joe DeMartin suggested the dates they'd like us to come in are September 13, 16, or the 18th. So the next school, Capital City Charter, um, Mary Phillips is the teaching fellow. And in this class, there are about 16 students and they're very interested in DC statehood. Um, they're interested in debate and, and voting issues in DC. And their suggested, her suggested um, dates for us to come in are between September the 13th through the 18th. And as you can see, under the class time, uh, you'll see when the teaching fellow is actually in the classroom. So for example, Mary is there Monday 10 to 11.25, Wednesday 8.30 to 10, and Friday 9.25 to 11.15. So we can probably choose any of those times and say that we, we have a team that could go in during, during that time. The next school is Baloo High School, which is over in Anacostia. And um, on last uh, Wednesday, when we talked to them, there were only four students enrolled in that civics class. And they were juniors and seniors. And they, again, were interested in DC statehood and um, some of the DC issues, legal concepts, and of course, the basics of voting. And for Baloo, um, they teach on Mon Monday, Wednesday, and Friday between 1020 and 1148. And their preferred dates for us to come in are September 27th or October the 9th. Um, the next school is School Without Walls. And this school is, uh, we have about 20 students who are very engaged in civics education, and they're particularly interested in DC statehood, basic information on voting requirements, what's on the DC ballot, and any other topic that's related to the district. So um, they are teaching Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, as I mentioned, and um, you have the contact name and her um, email right there. Um, the next school is School Without Walls. And School Without Walls, um, or did I already mention that one? I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, then we're at the last one, which is Dunbar. And Dunbar class size is around eight, uh, 14 students. And most of them are sophomores and only 15 years old. And the students there are interested in statehood and, and other issues specific to DC, um, they would like us to cover the history of DC voting, uh, current voting requirements, how voting works in the district, what's on the ballot, and maybe some information about the district government structure, which would lead into a discussion for DC statehood. And um, Dunbar teachers, Marissa Erickson teaches on Monday and Wednesday, from 110 to 218, and Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, it looks like she's there five days a week. Um, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, 1245 to 205. And her preferred date is September the 26th. 
So that's pretty much the information that we got from the fellows. And they were very um, interested in us coming in, participating in the classroom. And they said, if we have any suggestions for them to introduce us to the students that we should provide that information to them ahead of time. So maybe we can have um, a discussion about that later. Thanks, Deborah. Um, Nasdar, do you want to run the, um, the slide deck? Sure, no problem. Let me just pull that up for us. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. Let me try to put it in the slideshow. It's not loading like that, right? Okay. Yeah, it just says loading. Yeah. Okay. So I can run through it just sort of without putting it into slideshow mode, if that's okay. Um, so I will go over the slides just so we sort of have a general understanding of the formatting and what to expect um, and sort of the purpose of the slides, but I won't go too in depth because as Barbara mentioned earlier, we do have a script that we'll provide you with and that sort of has, you know, additional points you could um, address during each slide. So if there's any sort of questions on that afterwards, you can reach out to me, but I'll just do a very basic overview right now. Um, so oh, hey, we, Nazar, yes, quick question. So are we not doing the final recording tonight? We're just going, this is just the training session. Yeah. So this is just sort of to get familiar with everything, but we have, um, all the materials in a folder together where, so, you know, you can refer back to the script for the slides and, and, um, you know, I will continue to make small edits to the slides as well as, as we get closer to these dates, but just to, to have a very basic sort of understanding and familiarity with the presentation that we'll be taking into these classrooms. Oh, okay. I thought we were recording this so that this could be used for future purposes. Yeah. So it's, we do have, um, a number of individuals who weren't able to attend tonight's session. So we will record this for them to come back and refer back to it and become familiar sort of before um, going out into these classrooms. Okay, okay, yeah. thanks. No problem. You, um, so Nastar, maybe we could circle back um, and um, ask Deborah to to speak briefly about the feedback we, you know, we, we received sure. from, the, um, from the fellows, you know, about the importance of making this interactive, engaging the students in conversation rather than making a didactic. Jeffrey, do you want to comment on that? You're muted. Sorry. I'll say just a few things that stood out from our uh, meeting with the, the um, leaders of the fellows program. And they just gave us some feedback about last year's presentations. And basically they encouraged us not to talk at the students, but try to engage them through um, questions and interactive exercises. And um, I think what we have here is a wonderful outline with a lot of content that we can use as a framework, but I think 29 slides is a bit too much um, because our presentation is going to be between 30 minutes and 40, uh, maybe an hour at the most. And the uh, AU students uh, wanted a small group of us. That's why we only have two people going in. They want the students to be more engaged in the presentation, not just um, here from us and going through each slide. That's uh, just not the teaching method that they would like. And then um, they just suggested that we, we have a, a diversity of teachers if possible. So um, I think that we have the bones here and I think it's really good. I just think we need to think about our presentation style and come in with questions and, and interaction whenever we can. 
Can I add to that since I taught three of these classes last year? Yeah. So we did have two interactive exercises, neither of which I would say they both bombed. So <laughs> I think we need to think about what what might work. And I don't have any suggestions for that because it had seemed like what we had would be um, engaging, but it wasn't engaging. And so just one caution is a lot of these kids have not the easiest lives on earth. So don't be surprised if somebody is sick and sleeping or somebody's a new mom with a sick baby and not paying attention or, you know, the bunch of boys get in the back of the class and, and cut up. But I would say, I would say, it would be a lot if 50% of the students were really engaged. So that's something to keep in mind. So the whole issue of trying to be where they are is, is super important. And I think last year, Carol Grodson, who talked about statehood, did a particularly good job of that because she didn't particularly adhere to slides. Uh, and she did talk a little bit about herself and she has an unusual background. So, you know, that was interesting to the kids about the first time she voted and things like that. So the less we are about slides and the more we are about humans talking to humans, I think the easier it will be. Another thing that I found was helpful was since some of the federal issues are not especially immediate in their lives, I brought in some examples of recent local um, initiatives. So the crime bill for one uh, and the um, baby bonds bill. So things that they might be particularly interested in. So some of the, the boys who are cutting up in the back started paying attention. We talked about the fact that if some police officer decided to detain them, they'd be held there until court. They could be held there until court. So that was all news to them. and that interested in them. But I think if we had talked about the federal election, that would have been less interesting. So it's really, I think it's really important to try to read that audience. And it's, um, I didn't find it easy, but um, I think also um, diversity of folks in the classroom. And, and I think one of the big issues was most of us who went into the classroom are retired women. Uh, and I think the kids will relate better to younger people. So I'm, I'm thrilled that we will have people like NASDAQ joining us so that I think that's going to be terrific. Just to quickly add to that, excuse me, I haven't given like maybe a hundred of statehood presentations now. The slides, I think the team has done a fantastic job and they're only meant to be a template. So everyone has a different present style and you just got to figure it out as you give these presentations. So I see this as a baseline foundation and people can choose to go wait where they're most comfortable and use a style that is them. So that's really important to, uh, and so the script will help for especially new people, but as you learn the slides, you can do your own thing. Thank you, those are wonderful comments. Um, Nasdar, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, so yeah, so we just sort of start off with a brief introduction of, um, you know, who we are at the league and what we do. This is all one slide, it's just animated. So once we put it into slideshow mode, you'll see it's just um, sort of the the bullets pop, uh, the bullet points pop up. Um, so we are, this is sort of just the overview, working to empower voters and defend democracy. And then we do get a little bit more into um, some of the history of the league. But um, again, this might be cut down a little bit moving forward, so we, don't necessarily have to use all of this. This is just sort of for foundational knowledge. Um, like we've been saying, this is really just sort of um, baseline slides. Um, use what you think is relevant. Um, feel free to leave out what you don't think will resonate or is relevant. Um, so we we try to give you know um, enough information so that you feel comfortable talking about all of this, but you don't need to feel obligated to use every single point. Um, so the objectives we have here. So we really want um, this the scholars um, in the classroom to become familiar with the voting process. We want them to learn more about the upcoming election and start really thinking about issues that matter to them and that they care about um, and just get them excited about voting and encourage them to, to sort of talk about it with their friends and families and get everyone on the same page. Um, so it's really, um, we, we have a few sort of different lenses we're looking at things through. So we definitely want them to just learn about sort of the voter registration process and what it means to vote um, kind of at large. And then also just um, in, in addition to sort of the upcoming election, thinking about um, DC statehood and maybe more local issues that resonate with them or that they care about as well. Um, so just sort of showing that there are um, a number of 
perspectives that they can bring to this. This is the two minute video um, Barbara touched on earlier. I will not play it now um, just because I think we're also not in slideshow mode and I don't want to take up too much time, but um, you'll be able to sort of look through this beforehand and get familiar with it. Um, but this is about a two minute clip and that we will play. And then um, we just have sort of voter eligibility requirements just to get them familiar with, you know, who is able to register to vote. We have that split up into um, a couple of slides, um, including sort of pre-voter registration, and then also just common misconceptions about voting. Um, just so, you know, um, we, we cover all the bases. This is also just an animation. So it's just one slide there that looks like three. So um, the presentation is not as long as it sort of initially seems. Um, following that, we just have sort of the power of the Gen Z vote to hopefully motivate them and show them um, in numbers that their vote is important and matters. And then um, we have, we try to sort of pepper in a number of um, interactive questions just to spur discussion and get them sort of engaged and thinking um, about the topics at hand. Again, you know, um, like, we've talked about, you feel free to sort of read the room and, and see what resonates, but um, this is just sort of a good starting point for kind of getting them um, interested, engaged, and just thinking about the topics that we're presenting on. So first up, we have just why do you think it's important to vote? And that hopefully that can sort of be uh, just a good introductory sort of question to get everyone um, thinking. And then we move into, so what are some issues that matter to you? And hopefully this will personalize it a bit for them, get them thinking about what they, um, care about and help them realize that, you know, it's important to, to vote um, in order to have those concerns be sort of addressed and heard. And then we have just a, a brief slide on sort of a vote 411 and how to know what's on the ballot. Um, following that, we do have the actual sort of um, breakdown of what they can expect on the ballot. I know this is a lot of text, um, so you don't have to, of course, go through every single line by line item, but just so that it's there um, sort of for everyone to see in case this is helpful to anyone, we have that there. Otherwise they could just use, um, you know, the previous slide and scan the QR code or go to the website to learn more about this on sort of their own time. Um, we have just some key 2024 dates for DC voters. Um, so this is um, just touching on a few upcoming deadlines, including the October 15th deadline we mentioned earlier. Um, and then this is just sort of uh, no sort of additional context, just, um, we are just adding in here that in order to be able to do all of this, you do need to register to vote and we'll help them at the end as well with that um, if necessary. We will then transition sort of into DC statehood um, and um, sort of what comes to mind when they think of DC statehood. Of course, it's okay if, um, you know, students are not familiar with it or don't um, really know what that means. We can also encourage them to just um, guess what that means or whatever it may be, just to make this again as interactive as possible and just get them um, sort of thinking outside the box and, and thinking on issues maybe they have not previously considered or thought about. Um, and we try to keep this pretty sort of baseline and just to give them a broad understanding of what DC statehood is, what it means, um, how it impacts them and why they should care. So um, not going sort of too much into the details just to sort of keep them from becoming overstimulated or overwhelmed with a plethora of information. So just really keeping it at the fundamental um, sort of basic level of what it means. So um, just again, keeping it interactive, not, not you know, even in the script, um, getting too into the nitty gritty details. So essentially um, we just did a few slides on that um, and what they need to know. And then we move into why it matters and why they should care about statehood. Just one brief slide on that. Um, and time permitting, we did put in sort of an interactive activity following that where, um, you know, agree or disagree, DC will never become a state because Congress won't allow it. Um, and this sort of just depends on where you're at with time and how, how the room feels, of course, but we have um, this sort of diagram on the following slide in terms of maybe um, breaking the classroom up into different sections, depending on how they um, feel about the statement. And then this is just a way to sort of encourage um, dialogue and, and um, constructive conversation that can kind of get them again, thinking and um, bouncing ideas off of one another. Um, but again, it's just sort of depends on where you're at with time and, and what the energy is like in the classroom and whether it's resonating with students. Um, we just end can that I, with. Sure. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I just ask a question about that question? The, do you think DC will become a yeah. 
what was it, become a state because Congress won't allow it. I guess I'm wondering how did we, I mean, I understand this question, but how did we, because I think the framing is a little, is a, maybe a little strange. So I'm just wondering how we came up with this question. Right. So, um, Barbara, I don't know if you want to touch on this a little bit, but from my understanding, I think um, we did encounter someone who uh, tried to sort of make this argument at some point. Um, and the sort of intention, I think, is to explain like how the process of statehood actually looks like once we've had the conversation. But um, I'm not sure, Barbara, if you want to add anything on to this here. Yeah, you know, they, you know, these are comments we, you know, sometimes hear when we're out and about um, that it's never going to happen. Um, you know, it's hopeless. Um, you know, that that kind of thinking. You know, yeah, I, I, which I might recommend just saying, do you think D.C. will never become a state and take the because Congress won't allow it part out? Because some people also don't understand the process of how D.C. will become a state. So they don't even yep. know that Congress you know, needs to pass the House, the Senate and get presidential sign off. And then there is also a myth that it requires a constitutional amendment, which is not true. So it, it just may be simpler to say, do you think DC will become a state or do you think DC will never become a state? I just think that might be a little better, but that's just my my two cents. Thank you. That's valuable. Yeah. Thank you, appreciate that. I will go back and make that edit. Um, and then we just sort of end the statehood section by actions you can take to support statehood. That includes signing our DC statehood petition, talking to your friends, neighbors, and relatives. Um, you can go to the League of Women Voters of DC website for more information. And then um, I, I'm not sure why it's not here, but it should be linked. I'll go back and fix that. There's a link to a video. Um, you, they can also watch that covers sort of commonly asked questions about statehood. Um, so that's, these are all just actions they can take afterwards. We just put in the map of um, what it would look like um, if we were to achieve statehood. Um, and then just sort of ending on how you think you can use your voice to make a positive difference. And hopefully at this point, um, the students will be able to see that voting is important and makes a tangible difference and feel motivated to, to kind of express um, why they think it's important for them to register to vote and um, get out there and, and go to the polls. Um, and then we just end here and um, we, the goal is basically to factor in vote, helping them register to vote as part of the 30 minutes we are aiming for to do the presentation. So, um, you know, if maybe we do 20 minutes of the presentation, 10 minutes helping them register to vote or whatever is most useful, but um, the, the registering to vote should not be sort of outside of that 30 minute time frame we are giving ourselves here. Thanks, Inez Dar. Dia Bardwell is in the meeting, and Dia is one of the creators of the uh, presentation. Dia, do you want to add anything? Um, not particularly. I think you did a really great job explaining that. Um, just to like echo um, what Nazdar was saying about really wanting this to be conversation based and finding thing that things that resonate with the kids. Um, a lot of these kids don't understand the basic structures of government. And while that's changing a little bit with the DC State Board of Education, new social studies curriculum, we can still try to use this to fill in those gaps and creating these conversation spaces, especially about DC State is a great way to do that. Do we have a slide in here that, oh, thank you. This is so comprehensive. Do we have a slide in here that talks about how we become a state? So there's no specific um, slide, but the sort of um, here where we do the agree or disagree activity, the script um, points are related to um, what that process looks like and sort of, um, so the, the intention is really to get them to sort of start um, engaging in this conversation, but then taking the time to sort of um, address, you know, any myths that are um, coming up and also explaining what the actual process looks like. Yeah, additionally, um, that this is really meant for to have students be more engaged. So a lot of times when we're doing this activity in classrooms, um, it almost requires students to give an answer, right? So if you're having the entire room, get up, move around and say, hey, this is moved to like a position in the room, that really doesn't give them an option to ignore the question, right? So it's just another level of engagement that we're trying to seek. 
Yeah, I, I like that. I like that it's in the script. And even if they don't want to participate, they have to participate. So. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Um, Nastar, do you want to explain um, how we would organize the volunteer help, what we need um, for the volunteers to share with us? Yes, absolutely. I'm going to stop the screen share for now. And then, um, so yes, um, in order to sort of um, continue forward and get everyone's schedules figured out, it would be extremely helpful if everyone could send me an email with sort of your availability um, during, you know, Monday through Friday during the school days, what that looks like. So then we can, and if you have a preference, you know, for a specific school, um, you can feel free to send that my way as well. But just let me know what your schedule looks like so we can get a sense of who's going to be available at what times um, so we can start um, getting things scheduled on the calendar. And I'm going to put my, e yeah, exactly. Thank you so much um, for putting that in the chat. So that's my email there. Please, by sort of the end of this week at the latest, um, send me an email with just what your availability looks like throughout the week so we can start kind of getting everything organized. And if you have any sort of follow-up questions or anything else, you can put that in there as well. Um, I wanted to ask a question. Do you think it would be important for us to be in communication with the fellows before we go in? We have their emails and then uh, maybe one of the suggestions we could ask the fellow to introduce the fact that we're going to be there next week or tomorrow and we will be helping students uh, register to vote and talk about voting and just kind of get them prepared for us to go in. I don't know, what do you think of that? I think that's a great idea. I think that's one of our first steps is to contact the teaching fellows, reach out to them and, and set a date for the visit. Um, you know, next week is gonna be incredibly busy um, for the league because it's National Voter Registration Day. Um, so, you know, this is an ambitious calendar that they set for us, but, um, you know, hopefully they will be flexible. But we'll we'll reach out to the teaching fellows this week. Um, and then as Nastar said, we, we need the we need to know the availability of our of our volunteers, and then we will match the volunteers to the um, to the high schools. And also, Barbara, one thing Yelin suggested in the chat that we send out the calendar uh, we were going through with sort of the schools, the fellows and the date. So we can definitely do that as well. I can send that out afterwards so that it's easier for you to sort of let me know what your schedule looks like throughout the week. Can you add to that um, schedule uh, at the beginning of our conversation, Deb mentioned particular things that each fellow thought their students would be interested in, and they're different, and some are different from what's in the slideshow. Could you add what those interests are? And then if somebody's inclined to do that, we could adapt to meet that. So for example, if there's a classroom of 15 students, you might focus less on dates to register and things to that and that, and, and try to maybe emphasize statehood more or, or whatever. But I did note that some of the students had some very different interests um, and it'd be great to meet what they've requested. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. I'll go ahead and add an additional column for Thank that as well. Sure. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, we're very fortunate to have Yulin Zhang with us. Um, she's going to talk a bit about statehood issues. But before we do that, um, I'd like to ask our, our volunteers in the room um, if you have any comments or questions. Any burning questions or thoughts, concerns? Yeah, I'm just wondering just noticed... about... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. You, you first. And that's cool. Yeah, I was just curious about, like, I know we, we should deviate from the presentation, you know, certainly to, like, you know, make sure we're keeping the uh, students engaged and, you know, making sure it's not, um, it, it tailors to kind of each presentation we give. But what are kind of, like, the rules about, like, the guidelines about deviating? Like, how, is this something we should, like, run, run by first or it's kind of in the moment? Like, what is, how is it done, like, in the past previously in terms of deviating and making it different for each each time we do it? Pam Wesley, do you want to address that? Because you did a couple of these last year. I'm <laughs> sorry, I didn't catch the whole thing. Um, but the, I think the question was deviating from the prescribed script. So um, at the beginning of our call, Deb, Deb and um, 
Barbara had met with the AU fellows recently, and they each talked about what the students in their classrooms are interested in. And we also have the really useful information as to how many students and their ages by class. So for example, one of the classrooms has 15 year olds only. So if you're gonna teach that classroom, my recommendation would be to go through the script and think about both what, whatever the issues are, I don't know what they are for that classroom. See if they're covered in the slideshow. If they're not, maybe create a slide or two and um, you know touch base with some of the people who've done this more often. If you're not familiar with um, what we might put in such a slide, you could just email us all and somebody would get back to you. Uh, and and for the younger students who can't even pre-register to vote, maybe take out any of the details about registration and just mention that, you know, when they're 16, they'll be able to pre-register, but you might not need to spend as much time on that. Maybe you'll spend more time on statehood or something like that. Um, it's a terrific slideshow, but it's really two classes worth of information there, especially if you're going to be interactive, as interactive as I think we'd like to be and as interactive as you've built into that. So, you know, if, if it looks like it's a class that could use less of one thing and more of another, there's certainly plenty of material there. And I think then when you're in front of the class and their eyes are glazing over, you might, you know, just sort of not spend so much time on that topic and move to another topic or, you know, jump to, excuse me, one of the interactive exercises so um, you can engage them and then maybe backtrack if you need to backtrack. Does that help? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think the point is, um, <clears throat> you know, to make this as interactive as possible. So, you know, if you, you know, if your students, you know, are very interested in a certain issue or, you know, kind of want, want to go off track, um, you know, from, from the set presentation, that's fine. But you would, you know, you would be in the classroom, you know, with another lead person um, who, you know, who, who's experienced, you um, so, so you could work together. But I think as Yolene said, the point is not to be married to the script, but um, you know, to engage the kids where the kids are and each classroom is gonna be different. Uh, Laura, I think you oh, had your hand yeah, up. Yeah, I just saw that a couple of the schools mentioned this Friday as uh, one of their dates. So we'll, this be happening that soon or will it be starting next week? I think Friday is ambitious. <laughs> so, you know, probably next week, you know, we're thinking um, and probably the last week of September and the first week of October would be good targets. Most and of the uh, classrooms said like the 26th of September, 18th of September. And I think if we have volunteers that can do those dates, we could just tell the students we can come on this date and not say, you know, not just because they said they could, we could come any time between the 13th and October 9th. So I think there's some flexibility. And if we have volunteers, we could just say, we'll, we'll be able to come in on these dates. All right, thank you. Any other um, points, questions, comments? All right, I'm, we're going to turn it over now to Yulin Zhang. Uh, Yulin's a leader on Elderly VDC Statehood team, and we invited her to give you an overview of DC Statehood. You know, many of you are not um, not natives of Washington, DC. Uh, maybe you're just here um, while you're in school. Um, and so DC Statehood is, um, it is, uh, may, maybe a new issue for you. So Yelin is going to give us an overview. Thanks so much, Barbara. Thanks for inviting me. And just so I make sure I touch on the right things, I know when you and I discussed, Barbara, I thought we were recording today for future use. So how should I use this time? Because we did go over the slides. So I want to make sure I answer everyone's questions. Do you want me to just give a quick overview and then take questions? Sure. Okay, sounds good. So 
Hi, everyone. I can't see everyone that's on the call because uh, I think I'm being spotlit, but thank you so much for joining. So as Barbara and Nasdar mentioned, the League of Women Voters here in D.C., we have a, oh, thanks, Nasdar. We have a statehood committee and it's called uh, Full Rights in D.C. Statehood, and it's been around for some time. And it is led by an amazing individual, Ann Anderson, and she has been fighting for statehood for more than half a century. So she is really the person who knows the ins and outs of statehood and has been engaged in the movement for some time. And then in addition to that, it's myself. I started working with our statehood team I think close to eight years now, which was when I first joined the League of Women Voters. And I myself, I've been in DC for about 14 years, originally from Michigan. And interestingly, I think like many, when I first moved to DC, I had no idea of the concept of statehood. I wasn't thinking about DC not being a state and being a city and what that means for all of us. And uh, like many, I, I mean, I don't know if you guys have graduated or when you graduate, how you're, if you're thinking of leaving DC or if you're staying here. And like many, I thought I was gonna leave DC within five years, but here I am 14 years later. So we have an incredible, incredible team, Ann Anderson, Ann Stauffer, who is the VP for Issues and Advocacy at the League of Women Voters. And then of course, Nasdar, who has been working with us on statehood, I think for the last, now maybe more than two years, right, Nasdar? Okay, okay, great. So um, in addition to the slides, when we talk about uh, statehood. So when I started, we actually traveled around the country to schools, universities, nonprofit organizations, other league chapters, and we talked about statehood. And I think when you guys go out there, you'll get a lot of questions like, do real people live in DC? Do people just commute into DC? And are they all working for the government or lobbyists or in politics? And people just have this incorrect assumption that DC people don't actually live in DC. But the reality is that we have approximately 700,000 residents and growing and people live and work in DC. They're born here, they retire here. And when we went for Capitol Hill Day to visit new members of Congress and talk about statehood, I was actually in a meeting with a staffer. And he said to me, he said, you know, it's interesting that you guys complain about DC not being a state because like, why would you just, why would you move here if you don't like DC? And I said, excuse me, people are actually, people are born in DC. We don't just all move here. And the ones who do move here, like myself, I absolutely love DC. I love the neighborhood that I live in. I love my neighbors and I just wanna see the city continue and hopefully stay to be a state one day flourish. So you'll get questions like that, that real people don't actually live in DC. And then of course they think that, you know we all work in certain professions, but DC has a, a very diverse econo economy and hospitality and consulting and tech, healthcare, et cetera. And we also have more than 130 unique neighborhoods in DC. So uh, probably probably some of you who go to AU, maybe you, you live in, was it like Van Ness or Cleveland Park? I mean, we have so many different neighborhoods and DC, as you know, is divided into a quadrant structure and we have eight different wards <clears throat> and each ward is led by a council member and then we have our at-large council members. Uh, we have a chair and we have a mayor. And so several examples about why statehood is important, because some people think that that statehood is just a nice to have. So I think many of you will remember the January 6th insurrection on the Capitol. Now that was a very very, it was a very terrible and scary and also disgusting time in our history to see that happen at our nation's capital. I remember exactly where I was, what was happening, and it was a very emotional experience, I think, for all of us. The fact that we are not a state, so when we are a state, the governor can call on the National Guard immediately. 
but because we have a mayor, she does not have the 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 power, the rights of a governor. And so she had to go through the presidency, the Pentagon. And so that caused a delay. And obviously people were in physical danger. So that's one example. Another example is years ago, because ultimately the way, you know, DC Council, they propose legislation, the mayor signs off on it, and then it ultimately it goes through Congress for review and approval, ratification. But when we're not a state, Congress can continue to use DC, as Ann Anderson has used the term, as a petri dish. We're essentially a petri dish where they can conduct tests, even though these are leaders that we did not elect into office. And one of the tests they did was that years ago, we had funding you know, for safe needle exchange to prevent the transmission of HIV AIDS. And Congress took that funding away. And as a result, the there was a, a skyrocket rise in the transmission of HIV AIDS to the point where we had the highest transmission in the country. So we don't want Congress meddling in our affairs when they don't understand the residents, when they don't know what is needed. And we do have an incredible leader. We have Eleanor, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, who is <clears throat> who sits in the House of Representatives. Now she can mark up things on the floor, but she ultimately doesn't have a vote in the House of Representatives. So that is the issue. So she has been an incredible champion for DC statehood for decades. And she is definitely a fighter, but without us having a vote in the House, you know, we we will forever not be represented in Congress. So what we, um, and this is something the team looked up a little bit earlier, but once we become a state, you know, we will have representatives in the House of Representatives, and then we will have two senators. And essentially our current governing structure people will need to run for office again. So it's not like, you know, just because the mayor is the mayor right now, she doesn't automatically become the governor. There needs to be some sort of special election. Um, so of course, one of the other things as you are giving these presentations, pushback you'll get is, oh, well, you know, DC statehood is a partisan issue because Republicans don't want DC to become a state because they believe that once we become a state, we'll automatically get to Democrats as senators. Now, of course, that could happen, but as in the case when Hawaii and Alaska became a part, <clears throat> became states, they they actually switched their parties. You know, one started as more Democratic leaning and then became Republican and vice versa. So that certainly could happen in DC. However, the position of the League of Women Voters is that 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 statehood is not a partisan issue. This is, you'll see in one of the slides, it says this is a human rights violation. Having DC statehood and having a representation at the highest levels of government, that is a human right, rights issue. And the United Nations, a lot of people don't know this, has actually said that the fact that DC is not a state is a human rights violation. So you could put that in in one of your pockets to, to bring up. So a lot of people are definitely shocked and uh, surprised to hear that. And DC, I think Congresswoman Holmes Norton has also said that we are the only democratic capital in the entire world that doesn't have uh, recognition at the highest levels of government. So. So clearly, D.C. statehood, a lot of people understand that statehood is important. So when you talk to D.C. residents, maybe with your friends or people who've been here for a little while, they certainly support statehood, but they feel that there is some level of apathy because this fight has taken so long. But in, 20, in the early 2020s, so H.R. 51, which is the D.C. Admission Act, that passed twice in the House. So we got enough co-sponsors in the House to pass D.C. becoming a state. And in the past few years, we also had the highest number of co-sponsors in the Senate. 
you know, the bill was led by Senator Carper, who uh, I believe has retired or is retiring, but he has been an incredible champion of statehood. So we've made incredible progress. And as I mentioned earlier, once we get it passed in the House and then the Senate, and then we get presidential sign off, then that's when DC becomes a state. And a an argument that a lot of conservatives have made is that, you know, like I said earlier, that it requires a, a constitutional amendment. That is a myth. That is absolutely not true. You follow the steps that I just mentioned. So I think the purpose of when you guys talk about statehood is just to help people understand the nuances and share with them that DC is really made up of people who are born here, live here, work here, have families here, retire here, and they have a lot of pride as DC residents, and that this fight will be successful. And I guess the last thing I'll mention is that, you know, some people say, well, what about retrocession, which means DC going back to Maryland or Virginia. But the fact of the matter is there are representatives that have basically, at least from Maryland, and I think from Virginia too, but definitely from Maryland have said that, you know, we want DC, we don't want DC to retrocede to us. DC should become a state and DC residents want to be, want to keep DC intact. So I think that's the, the last thing I'll mention. And basically just have a lot of fun. Uh, DC statehood is, we just have to keep it in the forefront of everyone's minds. And I would say a really good action for, especially for students and um, younger people who are good at social media is to post about statehood or do TikToks, um, do videos. So one of the things that uh, NASDAQ and myself and some of the team members we're working on now is we have a Youth Voices for Statehood showcase coming up on Friday, September 20th, which all of you are invited to. It is taking place at The Arc, which is a, a, a nonprofit organization, but they also have creative arts facilities. It's in Southeast DC. And we have invited some youth to come and talk about statehood and what it means to them. Um, and in the past, people have submitted like awesome TikTok videos, spoken word. So there's so many creative things that you can do with statehood, which I am not talented in, but I hope that the people who are creative in that can do that. But I think we just need, you know, people to get excited about it through different artistic activism modes. Um, I guess the last thing I definitely would be remiss by not mentioning one of our past uh, league board members, Barbara Garlock, she led an initiative called Quilts for DC Statehood. And essentially she gathered all uh, dozens and dozens, I think 60 quilters from across the country to submit a quilt. And these gorgeous quilts actually, like, I mean, growing up, I thought quilts were just like little pieces of patchwork, not to minimize it, but these were like portraits, like really beautiful. They were like oil paintings. Like one was the portrait of Kamala, Kamala's portrait and a young, uh, young girl looking up at her photo that was made into a quilt. And then we ended up auctioning off all these quilts and raised, I think more than $7,000 uh, to continue to support our, our projects. But that's an example of something that any of you could lead and we are all open to those ideas. And essentially, if you have an idea, the league also just promoting the league a little bit is, is you know, entrepreneurial. If you want to do something and you can take the initiative, we are very happy for you to, to lead it. So any of you who are interested in getting more involved, especially on the statehood side, please let me know. And I can also put you in touch with Ann Anderson. So I will stop right there and see if you have questions or comments. Thanks, Yulian. I'll just jump in. Um, what would what would be the procedure for DC becoming a state? Yes. How well, as I mentioned, it would be it needs to pass the House, so HR fifty one, and then it needs to pass the Senate, SR fifty one, and then it gets presidential sign off. Okay. And what about the Senate filibuster? Would it come into play? It could, and I am not an expert on that, so I think Ann Anderson would be better to answer that. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think to Pam Wessling's point, you know, we, we do need 
do need a slide that um, explains the procedure so that, you know, the scholars don't think that this is um, pie in the sky by and by, that it, you know, can really happen. Um, we've been waiting for this for how long? Since the 1800s, um, and the time is, you know, the time is, is past due. I loved all the, um, you know, and thank you for that. It was really terrific. I loved all the reasons why um, and like addressing retrocession and things like that. There was another point that I think Carol Grodson used, which was some people say you're too small. And she had some state that has a smaller population than we do, which I thought was really compelling as well. I forget. Yeah, yeah. Wyoming and Wyoming. Vermont each have a smaller population than D.C. Okay, great. Thanks. I'll try to remember that. I'll write it down. Right. You know, maybe the um the, the handout 10 um you know 10 things about statehood, NASTAR, we could um make that available to the volunteers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of that is in the script as well, but if it's easier to just sort of see it clearly laid out, I will attach that as well when I send out the um sort of chart with the schools and the times. Okay. Anything else? Well, thanks everyone. You know, I hope this um, works out for everybody. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to engage young people um, in our democracy, um, and um, you know, and you know, on around issues that are of concern to them, like DC statehood. Um, so, you know, hope you'll join us and just let Nasdar know uh, you've got her email. And um, so be in touch with us. Oh, just one more question. Do we have enough people now or should we be recruiting others? So between all the people who've expressed interest, do we have enough for what, 10 people? Two class, I mean, two people to each class? We haven't posted it on, on our uh, website yet, you know, in the event calendar. Um, but I think, you know, we will go out to a few people like you, Pam, I'm really glad you're going to be able to do it. I will do one. Um, but, you know, but I but, but I do think we have um, a number of um, young volunteers. Um, That's great. Really great. You know, um, you know hopefully it will all, um, it'll all work out. Terrific. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for being together. Thank you. Bye.